Almost every nuclear reactor in the world is based on the design of one man, a man who later condemned that design for being too dangerous and who spent his life working on an inherently safe reactor. This is the story of technological progress, political subterfuge, and the dream of clean, safe energy for all. Happy birthday, Alvin Weinberg. Hello and welcome. When you think about nuclear reactors, you probably imagine complex, redundant systems, the failure of which would cause catastrophe lasting thousands of years. You probably imagine expensive strip mining of rare minerals and waste which must be stored for millennia. You probably imagine massive over-budget projects which take decades to build and which nobody can afford to decommission. These are all valid concerns of the nuclear industry as we know it today. But these problems stem not from inherent dangers of nuclear energy, but from a design of the 1950s, which was literally the first idea that worked. The world's first nuclear reactor was a proof of concept called CP1. It was built in Chicago under Enrico Fermi and was used to prove that it was possible to produce plutonium for a nuclear weapon. Once the concept had been shown, the first industrial reactor began at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This reactor, called X10, provided the plutonium for America's nuclear weapons program, including the bomb which decimated Nagasaki. At the end of World War II, Oak Ridge turned its attention to peacetime applications for its research, and in 1948, physicist Alvin Weinberg began as director of research. Unlike some of his military superiors, Alvin was more focused on what the atom could do for humanity than against it. And it was his idea which gave rise to the use of water in a nuclear reactor. The nuclear chain reaction is maintained by neutrons smashing into the fuel. This causes the atoms to split, releasing more neutrons. But unfortunately, the neutrons from split atoms are moving so fast that they typically fly straight out of the reactor without ever touching the fuel. So something called a moderator is used to slow them down enough that they will do their job. What makes a good moderator is a matter of physics, but typically reactors use either graphite or water. What's important to understand is that the moderator is not slowing the reactor down, but rather creating the environment where the reactor can function. Weinberg had the original idea of submerging the nuclear fuel in water and using this as both the moderator and a coolant. This idea was at the time a proof of concept, but for better or worse, it worked. And this idea has become the foundation of almost every nuclear reactor in use today. But it is not without its faults. It was, after all, a proof of concept. The most serious problem with the water reactor is that water boils. So in order to have enough heat to make steam power to turn a generator, the reactor must be pressurized. Obviously, pressurizing hot radioactive water is not a great idea. Failure of any part of the core system will lead to an explosion of radioactive steam, so these reactors had to be built with many safety systems and redundant controls. Furthermore, because the only thing keeping the reactor cool is the constant flow of water, any interruption of that flow would cause the water to begin boiling away potentially leading to a meltdown. Modern reactors use triple redundant systems to ensure that the water keeps flowing, and in case of a steam explosion, the famous reactor dome is there to contain the outflow of steam. Some reactors, like Chernobyl, were built to much lower safety standards, and the result was catastrophic. But even well-designed reactors, like Fukushima, can fall victim to situations beyond the expectation of the designers. And what's more, even a fully functioning nuclear reactor is incapable of consuming more than about 5% of its fuel before the fuel rod assemblies contain too much byproduct to keep the reaction going. At this point, the fuel, still 95% potent, is retired as radioactive waste. As light water reactors began to take off, an entire industry emerged around bandaging up the problems of this design. But Weinberg was not satisfied. He wanted a reactor that would be inherently safe with all, all these redundant systems one that would be cheaper to build and thus more efficient, one that would even perhaps consume all of its fuel. While the nuclear industry was trying to figure out how to line their pockets, Weinberg was trying to figure out how to provide the world with cheap, clean energy. And for this, he turned his attention to molten salt. Salts have some excellent chemical properties because they are so inert that even in the face of neutron bombardment and gamma radiation, they will not break down or undergo chemical change. Furthermore, many salts are liquid at 1,000 to 2,000 degrees, so with salt as the coolant, the reactor could power an external steam boiler without the need to pressurize the reactor. This single design change eliminated 90% of the reactor's safety mechanisms while resulting in a safer overall design. In 1955, Weinberg became the director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and 
With the help of the U.S. Air Force, was, he was able to begin to realize his vision. The Air Force commissioned a project to develop a nuclear-powered bomber, which could stay in the sky for weeks or even months at a time. While obviously valuable, most of the physicists on the ground didn't think this could work. But the Blue Sky mission to create a reactor so light it could fly was what put wind in the sails of Weinberg's molten salt reactor. Ironically, it wasn't until 1960 when the Air Force finally pulled the plug on the nuclear bomber project that Weinberg's team had what they needed to begin the Molten Salt Reactor Experiment, or MSRE. The MSRE team used lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride, two salts with particularly good physical properties. And unlike the fuel rods, which are useless after 5% consumption, the MSRE used fuel which was dissolved in the salt, allowing wastes to be chemically separated so there would be no unused fuel. Because the salt is not an effective moderator, the reactor needed some other kind of moderator to make it work. And for this, they used graphite. The reactor core was filled with a matrix of graphite passages which would make the reactor work. This design had yet another advantage. With the fuel and the salt, it would only react when it was in the reactor core. The team used this to their advantage, installing a freeze plug in the bottom of the reactor so that any overheating or power outage would cause the salt to drain out into a containment tank, shutting everything down. The MSRE was not without its challenges, chief of which was the extreme corrosiveness of the liquid salts. The team used a special metal alloy called Hastelloy N, which held up during the life of the project, but its long-term corrosion resistance remains unclear. Also, one of the radioactive waste products is tritium gas, which has a nasty habit of soaking through metals and can be difficult to contain. But these are just engineering problems, and compared with the nuclear fusion which seems perpetually 30 years away, molten salt reactors probably would have been in production today if the MSRE hadn't been killed in 1969. What ended up killing the MSRE was neither scientific impossibility nor financial limitations. It was the combination of a nuclear industry which had grown accustomed to big contracts for patching up the problems with the water reactor and government dreams of a new reactor design called the Fast Breeder Reactor. The Fast Breeder promised to supply an endless plutonium for America's weapons industry and it was to be built in Southern California bringing a flood of money and jobs to the home turf of newly elected Richard Nixon. The Fast Breeder ultimately proved unable to solve the physical problems which Weinberg had identified from the start and 10 years later, the whole idea was thrown overboard. After the meltdowns of the water reactors at Three Mile Island and then Chernobyl, public opinion waned, and eventually the public wanted nothing to do with nuclear energy anymore. And by this time, all hope for molten salt was effectively lost. But even in his retirement, Alvin Weinberg continued to lobby for nuclear safety and non-proliferation. Alvin Weinberg was known for a special kind of humility. Despite receiving 28 honorary degrees, people who met him would often come away intrigued by his insight, but unaware of who he actually was. He was said to have a childlike curiosity, as a person who might ask a plumber what he was doing and how it worked, and listen in with genuine interest. Weinberg warned of the danger of carbon to the Earth's climate long before climate change became a political battleground. And in 2006, Alvin Weinberg died peacefully at his home in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He was 91 years old. In a more enlightened world, it is very probable that we'd all be using the power from Weinberg's molten salt reactors today. And since around 2010, we've begun to see a resurgence of interest in the tech, with projects now ongoing in 11 countries. There are still engineering problems to be solved, and the nuclear industry is famous for killing off projects. But these projects, particularly the ones in China and Canada, are showing a lot of progress. I hope you got something out of this. Unsung heroes really are everywhere, and we should always remember the critical importance of communication to society. Corruption is one of the biggest obstacles that stands between us and everything that we want to achieve. Give me a like if you think it was worth it, and comment down below about what you think about nuclear energy. Will it be Canada or China or maybe another country which wins the molten salt race? Or will it be crypto miners who end up pushing this technology over the edge? Share your opinion down below, and until next time, stay awesome.